On this Friday night, we look at the power and infamy of this date from two very different perspectives. On the anniversary of the Columbine school shooting, young people take to the streets and a Canadian court sentences a would-be mass killer inspired by that massacre. Meanwhile, pot activists use this day, April 20th, to celebrate a victory close at hand. Also tonight, North Korea's leader says he will suspend nuclear and missile tests. What might he want in return? Plus, the screens your kids press their noses up to and the connections to what many see as a growing childhood problem, nearsightedness. We'll look into the latest research. This is The National. When it comes to the massive violence guns can do, April 20th does hold an especially hateful association. You can sum it up in a word, Columbine, the beginning of a continuing plague of school shootings. 19 years ago, those kids ran frantically from a building in which 13 were killed. But this year, today's students, led by those from Parkland, Florida, are giving the anniversary a new meaning marking not just remembrance, but protest. We'll hear from them in a moment. But we want to start with a Canadian story that now shares this date and could have shared its horror. Because in an eerie coincidence, today a Halifax court sentenced an American woman who was obsessed with Columbine and tried to bring mass death to this country. Kayla Hounsell has the story. Sister Van Arath. Lindsay Savannarath's parents traveled to Canada from Illinois to learn their daughter's fate. She pleaded guilty to conspiracy to commit murder after plotting a massacre at the mall. Today, she was sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole for 10 years. It certainly sends a clear message that anyone who would think of participating in something to this uh, extreme, the random uh, killing of innocent citizens uh, will suffer very serious consequences. Back in February 2015, Savannah Rath wasn't worried about that. I've purchased the plane ticket. I'm leaving for Canada tomorrow, and the only way I'm coming back is in a body bag, she wrote to a friend. Seven and a half weeks earlier, she met Nova Scotian James Gamble online. The two quickly bonded over a shared fascination of the Columbine massacre, chatting online every day, planning to open fire in the food court at the Halifax Shopping Centre. Gamble had already tried to partner with his best friend, Randy Shepard. But while Shepard supported the plan, he wanted Gamble to kill him before the massacre itself. Two days before the attack, police got a Crime Stoppers tip. Savannah Rath was intercepted by the Canada Border Services Agency and arrested by police at Halifax Airport. The story didn't match. There were some discrepancies. She didn't have the money she needed. The plane ticket was purchased at the last minute. She was coming to visit a boyfriend but didn't really know where he lived. James Gamble killed himself as police closed in. Shepard is now serving a 10-year sentence. Today, the judge said he believed beyond a reasonable doubt the massacre would have taken place if not for that Crime Stoppers tip and the quick actions of the police. This made it very real, brought it home to us that uh, our community is at risk, was at risk, and that something very serious uh, was only narrowly averted. Savannah Rath gets credit for time served, meaning her first opportunity for parole will be seven years from now. But in this case, life in prison really does mean life, so she may never be released. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Halifax. Kate Batten was the lead police investigator on the Columbine massacre. Nova Scotia's prosecutors asked her to write a report on the similarities between the mall plot and Columbine. Those ties are unsettling. Batten says Savannah Rath and Gamble believed they were reincarnations of the Columbine killers. Savannah Rath saying, maybe Eric and Dylan have somehow become us, become part of our minds. Adding, when Eric and Dylan both died, their mission on Earth wasn't really finished yet, so they had to take us over. Batten says Savannah Rath and Gamble plan to dress like their heroes, all in black, aping their plans to right down to using sawed-off shotguns and Molotov cocktails, even planning to carry knives for when they ran out of bullets. But Columbine was given a much different meaning today, south of the border, where that high school massacre became a touchstone for this generation of students. Nothing has changed even before I was born. This was a decision that was left up to the adults, and they've proved that they weren't able to get the job done. So maybe it's about time they listen to the youth.
So just weeks after the first round of mass walkouts over the school shooting in Parkland, frustrated students in every state took to the streets again to protest against current gun laws. We want change! We want change! And it's obviously going to take a lot of change and a lot more marches to get our message across. They walked out from school, gathered in mass at rallies and held moments of silence all with the goal of turning public demonstration to political action. We can have all the walkouts we want, but if we don't walk into that ballot box and make our voices heard, these politicians aren't going to listen. In New York, the CBC's Stephen D'Souza followed one group of students as they walked out this morning from their high school in Brooklyn all the way to a mass rally in Manhattan. With more than 6,000 students, the biggest question for organizers at Brooklyn Tech wasn't going to be how many would walk out at 10 a.m. You want me to take that group over there? But whether they'd all make the trip into the city for today's protest. 15-year-old Alex Bavalsky is leading the charge and is confident in his classmates. I don't think anyone's going to go home. I, th I trust that everyone in my school uh, believes in this issue and really wants to fight and, 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 and protest. As the students pour into the subway, it's clear his trust isn't misplaced. This is actually many more people than I imagined. On board, the enthusiasm of the students is enough to warm the hearts of cynical New Yorkers. Once in Manhattan, they waste no time announcing their presence. Show me what democracy looks like! This is what democracy looks like! As they arrive in Washington Square Park, their voices join the chorus of students from dozens of schools around the city. One thing you notice very quickly in this crowd is that there's something missing, and that's adults. That's because this movement was purely student-driven and student-organized. Enough is enough! Enough is enough! What do we want? What do we want? Where do we want it? Now. Politicians in Congress are hoping that we're just going to forget, but we're not going to forget. We're going to stick to this. The inspiration of the Parkland, Florida students is everywhere, but for many here, this is about more than school shootings. It's about gun violence in their everyday lives, including their experience with the police. This is something that black people have been dealing with for far too long, um, and we're hoping to bring awareness to that as well. The Columbine tragedy shaped the world in which these students grew up. Today, they heard from one of the survivors, who thought that event should have been enough to inspire change. We all developed a sense of hopelessness and helplessness that anything would ever change. Now, for the first time in 19 years, she's optimistic. Yes, I absolutely 100% believe in these kids. This is a generation starting to realize its power. Once all these kids get together, black kids, white kids, Latina kids, kids from every different nationality and culture, this is when they start to listen. A bit of optimism with a dose of reality. I think I can be pessimistic about it because of what's been happening, but I'm optimistic enough to be out here. And the students here promise, whether it's on the streets or in the ballot box, you haven't heard the last of them. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, New York. The majority of Americans, 57 percent, now support new gun control laws, according to a new poll by The Washington Post and ABC News. That's up from 46 percent three years ago. And it's even higher than it was in 2012, after the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting, 26 people were killed, mostly children. Students at Columbine High School didn't participate in the nationwide walkouts. The school did what is done every April 20th since 1999 closing the school to mark the tragedy, taking time to reflect. But CBC News spoke with four survivors of the Columbine massacre about their memories of that day and their faith in the younger generation. 19 years ago, I, uh, it surprised me. Um, I did not expect anything like that in my high school experience. I can remember everything, I, exactly what I was wearing, what my backpack looked like, who I was talking to when it happened. and. There's a lot of detail that's still really fresh. When people ask me, when does it get back to normal? Is it after the one year anniversary? And unfortunately, what I tell them is it will never get back to normal. Well, I think now, almost two decades removed from Columbine, we can really look at kind of the effects that a tragedy like this has over a continuum. My primary emotion now is anger, and it's anger due to the lack of action in making any meaningful reforms. It's just crazy that it's still happening. It's hard to... It's really hard to get over that, that people don't seem to have the same objection to it that I do. You know, we have three constitutional concepts, freedom of speech, freedom to carry, and um, due process, which says that we cannot arrest you, detain you, or take possessions from you unless you break the law. 
Um, those three things have created a culture which have allowed for this uh, to happen. If anybody says that guns don't play a part in the problems that we're seeing, I think that that's absurd. To me, we're not dealing so much with a problem of the psychology of the perpetrator anymore. We're dealing with a, a problem with sociology. Hearing Columbine as an anniversary to, to instigate this um, can hit close to home. But I, I think our students should be angry. And I think in the United States, grassroots activism is what is now common to make our, our uh, politicians listen to us. And I'm proud of the students who are uh, at least joining the conversation. Having had the opportunity to talk with many of the students from Parkland, this isn't a new idea for them that happened after the tragedy. These are values that they have always held. They should be angry that the burden of safety has been pushed onto them, that we do these drills, these active shooter drills. Well, I think now they're saying the action needs to be taken. So we're going to take charge and hopefully uh, they have more success than some of the adults have. And one more note, there was a shooting incident at a school today in Ocala, Florida. Students there were planning to walk out, but then a 19-year-old who wasn't a student shot a 17-year-old in the ankle. Here's what else we're following tonight on The National. An outpouring of love from the music world for Swedish DJ Avicii. He died today at the age of 28. Also, Canadian kids are in need of glasses younger than ever. Why some say smartphones may be to blame. But first, a surprising announcement from North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. After an aggressive push to expand his country's nuclear program, Kim says his country is done with missile tests that they are no longer needed. He announced just hours ago that his regime has suspended its nuclear and long-range missile tests, and it plans to close its nuclear test site. That move comes just ahead of planned meetings be between Kim Jong-un and leaders of South Korea and the United States. At this point, no word on what will happen to the nuclear weapons and missiles that have already been developed. The North hasn't indicated any plans to dismantle them, but on Twitter tonight, President Donald Trump sounded optimistic, saying North Korea has agreed to suspend all nuclear tests and close up a major test site. This is very good news for North Korea and the world. Big progress. Look forward to our summit. So for more on this, I'm joined by Janice Stein from the Monk School of Global Affairs. Janice, uh, is it a little too soon to celebrate this? It really is, Adrian. There's always a but, and the but is we've been here twice before uh, where testing has been suspended. Uh, he's, he's not he, but his father offered uh, to denuclearize, and the deals broke down once in the negotiation and once because North Korea cheated. Uh, Verification is always an issue, too. Huge, huge. This is all going to be about the details. It's entirely possible they can reach a framework agreement and the negotiations can break down. It is encouraging that he suspended missile testing, though, because that's what was ratcheting up the tension. But we're at the early, early stage here. Okay, so regardless of whether it actually happens, it, it's this seems to make it feel like a meeting with Donald Trump is all the more likely because surely this would be a condition of that meeting. So what does Kim Jong-un actually want from that meeting? Well, I think there are two key things that he wants. First of all, and this is a tough one, he wants to be assured there will be no regime change. Mm -hmm. Right after that, he wants an end to these crippling economic sanctions, and he wants a peace treaty to end the war in Korea, in which the United States and China, as well as South Korea, will have to sign off. But that will come only at the end, after these nuclear weapons have been dismantled, and we are many moons away from that. I feel the skeptical winds. <laughs> Thank you, Janice. Janice Stein from the Monk School of Global Affairs. Sex, drugs, and pipelines. A full 18 months from the next federal election. 3,000 liberals are in Halifax tonight drafting policy on several big issues. Think of it as the party's unofficial campaign launch. Their aim is to revitalize the message of real change that Justin Trudeau promised in 2015. And they've turned to a one-time White House strategist for advice. David Cochran has the story. A warm East Coast welcome on the inside. We are addicted to energy. This technology helps us get... Less warm on the outside. 
Oil and pipelines are big P politics for the Liberals right now. We're under no illusions about how controversial these projects are. They divide political parties. So senior ministers tried to rally supporters who might be nervous about building an Alberta pipeline to the B.C. coast. And that's why I need you to stand up and support what we are doing to take action on climate change and also support projects that make sense in getting resources to market. The Liberals have promised financial support to get the pipeline built. They may eventually have to take a public ownership stake, but they've already taken political ownership of it even the Liberal MPs from B.C., where many voters oppose it. There are uh, people that obviously are opposed to the pipeline, but there are a lot of people in favour of the pipeline. Um, we're moving on the pipeline because, as has been said many times, it's in the national interest. This convention is about getting ready for the next election, and it's revealing the challenges of a party in power seeking a second term. Uh, I think it's important that people know what the choices are yeah. and what path they're choosing. So they're getting some heavyweight advice from David Axelrod. Barack Obama's former political advisor is advising the Liberals to defend their record, critique their opponents, but not go over the line. It would be derelict, as it was it would have been for us in 2012 in the U.S., not to make sure that people understood what the choices were. That is not to say that the politics of destruction are the way to go. It's a delicate balance for a prime minister who has built his brand on positive politics, who won government on the promise of change, but now has to run on his record. David Cochran, CBC News, Halifax. So David's highlighted the pipeline politics, but you might be wondering about the sex and drugs I also mentioned earlier. Well, the party's youth wing has proposed decriminalizing prostitution, while some grassroots liberals want the same for anyone caught with a small amount of any hard drug. In all, 30 resolutions are up for debate at the convention, but either way, worth pointing out, the outcomes will not be binding heading into the next election. So here's what else we're working on tonight on The National. It's Canada's last 420 before legalization. Is this country ready for the end of the pot prohibition? Plus, the music world marks the death of the young DJ Avicii. Why his short career left a mark. And why Canadian kids need glasses younger than ever. More time spent on tablets, cell phones computer terminals, TV, um, and perhaps less time outside. The full story next on The National. If you've ever spent hours on your phone only to look up at the real world and feel a bit bleary-eyed, you may at some point have wondered if all that screen time is actually bad for your eyes. Well, it might be, especially for children. Researchers point to an increasing number of kids who are myopic or nearsighted, and that can spiral into all sorts of other problems. CBC Health reporter Christine Birak has that story. It's, in a sense, like looking through a frosty glass. This is how more and more people are seeing the world. Up close, everything is clear, but move farther away and it all becomes a blur. Rates of myopia or nearsightedness are skyrocketing, and scientists say it appears Canadians are losing their vision younger than ever. So we're seeing children as early as five or six who are becoming myopic, and that's one of the concerns that we have, is the earlier onset than we used to see perhaps 20 years ago. A recent study has found that in children between the ages of 11 and 13, nearly 30% were nearsighted, and some didn't even know it. For 6 to 8-year-olds, it was 6%. Glasses are becoming the norm, but experts insist myopia can have serious consequences, from retinal degeneration and detachment to glaucoma and blindness. It isn't innocuous at all. As soon as you are myopic, your risk of complications associated with that increases. And the higher your prescription, the higher your risk. And the earlier myopia starts and goes undiagnosed, the faster it develops. Genetics play a role, but doctors think it's starting younger because of, you guessed it, all that screen time. And perhaps more importantly, what our screens are replacing. There's a large amount of evidence that shows that spending time outdoors is actually a protective factor against myopia. 
The study went further, showing that for every extra hour spent outdoors per week, a child's odds of being nearsighted dropped by 14%. Researchers say it may be the bright light, vitamin D, or the effects of sunlight on certain neurotransmitters. Either way, in China, where more than half of children are myopic, they're building glass classrooms. I usually actually just message an email. At home in Toronto, seven-year-old Jacqueline is busy. Her mother says limiting screen time to an hour a day is tough, but she'll try. In terms of my takeaway, when we think of how we budget our family time, I would definitely be more motivated to get outside more. <laughs> Foresight that could help her daughter see well into the future. Love you. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. Now, cutting screen time may not be possible for everyone, so eye doctors say if you can't get outside to keep your eyes in good shape, you can follow something called the 20-20-20 rule. That is, for every 20 minutes you spend staring at a computer screen or a smartphone, take a 20-second rest by looking at something at least 20 feet away. That should help refocus the eyes and hopefully be a strong reminder why you shouldn't forever be staring at things close up. Still ahead on the national, fish fraud is a serious problem in the Canadian seafood industry. Why what's on your plate might not be what you think it is. For example, in sushi restaurants, not a single sample of white tuna was actually tuna. We spoke earlier in the program about the dark significance of today's date. But if you've been outside at all, you may have gotten a whiff of one of the other connotations of April 20th or 420. It's been a rallying point for pot activists for years. But this 2018 edition is noteworthy because legalization in this country just around the corner. It's like it might be the last illegal 420 ever. And I thought I'd come for like the symbolic reasons of it. In other words, it's the last time these gatherings will be cloaked in a haze of defiance. In legal terms, at least, no more rebellious than beer gardens. And those titan-sized novelty joints and drum circles, perhaps more endearing than disruptive. In Vancouver, for example, 420 has long had a trade show feel. But for now, at many gatherings, the spirit of protest remains. They're taxing our medication. They're still arresting our youth. Um, you know, they're shutting down our access points. It would appear the core message of this day, that pot shouldn't be criminalized or stigmatized, has, for the most part, won. But society doesn't change overnight. Remember, this country has seen decades of prohibition-era policies, ranging from abstinence education to prison sentences. And now, the challenge for drug prevention advocates, how to modify their message. Cameron McIntosh explains. We know that kids are going to experiment with cannabis. Or some Concerned, uncertain, and more than a bit curious. At this forum on cannabis legislation, many parents are looking for a way to start a conversation. You know, I'm interested to hear from experts um, about all the various aspects, and I brought my daughter and her friend. So, you know, it's good for them to be informed, and for me. She's not the only one. You're about to see a lot more of this. Pot grows naturally. But it won't An ad from Drug Free Kids Canada offering person. families information kits on cannabis Talk and its cannabis effects. Part of a bigger national awareness strategy aimed at getting kids and parents talking. It's really not trying to, to make a message of to smoke or not to smoke. It's to make the, uh, the, the kids as well informed as possible. It's one of several agencies working with the federal government, which promised $34 million for cannabis awareness and education over five years. You're starting to see it in television ads. I don't drink and drive. No way I'm getting behind the wheel when I smoked weed, too. Next will be a push online and in mail-outs to schools. The Canadian Centre on Substance Abuse and Addiction is helping lead it. Just don't expect a just-say-no type of message. Fear-based approaches simply don't work. They don't resonate with young people. Uh, young people, what they've told us through our research is that they want to hear um, both sides of the story on cannabis. Primarily, it's effects on development and motor function. That's why so much of what you've seen already is focused on driving. 16 to 24 is the target age group. Your life can change in an instant. Don't drive high. Driving is the biggest concern for Stone. 
going to have a 15-year-old, and all her and her friends are going to be starting to drive. You can't just do an eight-week campaign and say, well, we're done. This has to be ongoing for years and years and years. Expect to see and hear more and more of it. Messages directed at crowds like this and Canadians in general as more campaigns launch closer to summer. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. While legalization for cannabis looms, thousands of Canadians have criminal records for simple possession of the drug. Which Canadians? Well, some police forces across the country don't gather arrest stats by race. And for others, the data might be there, but isn't easily found in one place. In Vancouver, for example, from 2015 to 2017, we know that black residents are just over 1% of the population, but make up 5% of arrests for simple marijuana possession. Indigenous residents represent 2.5% of the population, but more than 14% of arrests. Still, where criminalization has hurt the Indigenous population, on some First Nations reserves, legalization is being viewed as an opportunity. Jorge Barrera spent months looking into the explosion of cannabis businesses on reserve, where entrepreneurs aren't waiting for permission. On a slow day, five grand. On a fast day, ten. The pot business has been good in the Mohawk community of Tenenega. More than 20 shops sell cannabis in this community of about 2,000. Jamie Kunk alone smoke signals. He thinks the economic potential from legalization could end Tananiga's dependence on money from Ottawa. This industry has the ability that you could just go, we don't need it. But he doesn't believe any government, Canadian or Indigenous, has any say in how those businesses should run. They don't have rights, nor do they have the right to negotiate about my rights. And the chief says there's little the band can do to control the growing industry. But it doesn't matter what I say, they're going to do it because, you know, they're, they're, they're going to exercise their free will to participate in the economics of this industry. Since it will be up to the provinces and territories to enforce regulations, and because bans are governed by the Federal Indian Act, Miracle says it's an open question whether provincial pot laws will apply on reserve. It's a national uh, constitutional question because the First Nations people have not surrendered their right to, have, to, to, produce, to, to pursue an economy. But the provinces and the federal government say the law will apply. The sale of any cannabis or the production of any cannabis outside the license regime is a criminal offence. It's a criminal offence today and it will remain a criminal offence with the new legislation. Law enforcement is already a fact of life in the Iroquois community of Six Nations where the First Nations police force is cracking down on dispensaries. They came in like they're robbing a bank. A slow night at Seth Lafort's Mohawk Medicine store suddenly upended. There's a cop here with an AR, and he puts the, points a gun at her. And he's got a finger on trigger, and uh, he's yelling, get on the ground! Police also hit Jeff Hawks, but the raids aren't going to stop him. I have to come back hard and strong and right the next day and reopen again and, and just keep going. Hawk doesn't think the ban council should have anything to do with the cannabis business. I don't fully support the ban. I don't, you know, I try not to, but I think myself it should be up to the people. Mm -hmm. The people here, the people that know, the people who use, the people who are involved in this industry or, you know, have the knowledge of it. Back in Tenenega, Kunkel says he's not worried. He lived through the three decade long battle over untaxed tobacco sales and the tobacco shacks remain. Like I said 22 years ago, when it comes to tobacco, if you want to bring the fight to our front door, it's worth us fighting for. This is our health, our freedom, our economy, and who we are as a people. And we've just had enough. Canada and First Nations again find themselves in the tangle of a potential new conflict. The plant this time is different, but it threatens to uproot an old grievance. Jorge Barrera, CBC News, Ottawa. And we're not done with our 420 coverage. Coming up in tonight's moment, we'll reveal one of the day's most enduring mysteries, its origins. There's so many people out there claiming they started this uh, with things like, oh, we met at a pizza parlor at 420 and we sparked up. It's hilarious. But the one thing they all have in common is they have zero proof. You'll meet those characters and hear their story ahead on The National. But first, the DJ known as Avicii was a renowned pioneer of electronic dance music, or EDM.
He revolutionized the genre while just in his early 20s and developed a global fan base. Today, he was found dead at the age of 28. Feeling my way through the darkness. His real name was Tim Bergling, but the Swedish producer, composer, and performer rose to fame as Avicii, one of the few DJs who filled arenas and hit the mainstream. Oh, if the sky comes falling down. He loved making music, but was frank about the lifestyle dangers that haunt the EDM scene and the heavy drinking that led to some health problems. And unfortunately, it's something that a lot of artists do succumb to when you're on the road. Uh, you have a heavy tour schedule, you're surrounded by alcohol all the time. Avicii was found dead in Oman and no cause of death has been released. His peers in the EDM world offered tributes today, including Canada's dead maps. My sincerest and most heartfelt condolences to the friends, fans, and family of Avicii, he tweeted. Banter aside, nobody can deny what he has accomplished and done for modern dance music, and I'm very proud of him. For someone that was so young, he's left behind an incredible legacy. Earth Day is fast approaching, so tonight we bring you two stories about Canadians taking action. In a moment, we'll show you how the fashion industry is going green and what you can do to help. But first, seafood sleuths across the country are helping expose a bait and switch. It is fish fraud, and it's a costly problem here in Canada. The CBC's Tom Murphy has the story. How long does salmon take? Like 10 minutes. You think this is a normal dinner, right? But it's not. There's a detective at the table. All right, guys, cheers. Cheers. Wait, wait, wait a second. I need to test my hat. That's right. Michaela Bickford is taking a lab sample of her dinner for DNA testing. Nice. If it seems a little like an episode of CSI, it's because she's actually on the case of a food crime. Fisheries around the world are collapsing or about to collapse, and this is in part due to seafood fraud. We'll get back to the detective work in a moment. First, to the real concern, there's something fishy going on in the fish business. Oceana Canada, an advocacy group for ocean conservation, claims as much as 40% of seafood sold in this country is mislabeled. In Ottawa last year, the group tested 98 samples and found almost half of the fish were not what they purported to be, either labeled incorrectly or fraudulently. The main driver for this mislabeling is very clearly economics. Um, in every case where you find a substitution, uh, it's a less expensive species being sold as a more expensive species. The most common ones were, for example, in sushi restaurants, not a single sample of white tuna was actually tuna. So what were they getting? Well, instead of the much more expensive white tuna, customers were really getting a species called escolar, which is nicknamed laxative of the sea, the kind of fish that could really bring a party to an abrupt end, if you know what I mean. Here's the thing. According to Sylvain Charlebois, professor of food distribution and policy at Dalhousie University, fish fraud is extremely lucrative. So lucrative, he compares it to the value of street drugs. And we can actually relate that problem, fish fraud, to a problem like the heroin trade, which is worth $52 billion, according to some estimates. Uh, we don't, it's that bad. It's that bad. We don't know for sure how big the food fraud problem is or well, how big fish fraud is is, but it's massive. We're talking billions of dollars. Hence the need for these fish detectives. Nameless, faceless to you, but right now hundreds of them are all over Canada, in Vancouver, Toronto, and most recently Halifax. Volunteers for Oceana Canada, like Monica Fong. I kind of feel like I'm sneaking around, yeah. <laughs> I've been sitting in a restaurant and making sure the server doesn't see me slide a sample. You did this at a restaurant as well? I did this at a restaurant three days ago. I know there's a lot of black market fisheries and illegal fishing happening in big countries like China and Vietnam. And, and it's coming home to roost here. 
and it, that's being sold here. And, and it's not the seafood we often think it is. No, it's not. So back um, to that detective work. Well, according to the store, this is a uh, hake. The volunteers put a sample in the tube with a drying agent, record the type of fish, and then mail it off to Oceana Canada, which sends it to a lab for DNA testing. Where the fraud happens, no one really knows for sure. Fish are a global commodity, so they may be caught in one country, shipped to another country for processing, and shipped to a third country for distribution before it ever hits your plate. And the fraud can take place anywhere along that chain. The point of all this, says Oceana Canada, is to pressure government officials in this country to adopt fish traceability rules similar to those in the European Union and the United States. Ottawa says it's working on better labeling. It's not just fooling um, the public, people buying the fish, it's um, fooling the whole system. And that's why we really need traceability. We need to be able to trace where seed food comes from so we can really make informed decisions. Oh. A little food for thought, so the next time you sit down to a meal of fish, you actually know for sure what you're eating. Tom Murphy, CBC News, Halifax. Oceana says fish fraud can also take a toll on human health. You might unknowingly eat seafood that you're allergic to. Pregnant women might get a substitute fish that's high in mercury, and there have been cases of toxic fish, like puffers, being mislabeled. If you're looking for a way to mark Earth Day, you might want to consider the clothes in your closet. Fashion is apparently the second dirtiest industry in the world because of the way clothes are made and what's thrown away. But as Salima Shivji found out, some Canadian designers are determined to make a change. Oh, this is cool. I really love this. Here, amidst the endless racks of secondhand clothing, Cynthia Dam is in her element, searching for her next trendy item, all the while thinking of the environment. When I find the perfect one, I'm like, wow, this is, you know, so cool, because what you're doing is you're basically eliminating something from ending up in the trash. You evaluate at the end. She's part of a growing trend as more millennials are hitting thrift stores and spreading the word. I want to talk to you guys about sustainable fashion consumption. Studies show millennials buy a lot, but they're also the most environmentally conscious. They're driving the boom of the resale industry as celebrities jump on board to show off their eco-friendly outfits. And Canadian designers like Triarchy are thinking green too. This line is made entirely of old jeans, taken apart and made new again, something the designers felt they had to do. My God, we can do better than this. After seeing this 2015 documentary and realizing the impact their jeans had on the environment. Traditionally, a pair of cotton jeans, straight up 100% cotton jeans, can use up to 2,900 gallons of water by the time it, it lands on the shelf. So that is equivalent to 10,977 one-liter water bottles. So the high-end denim brand changed its entire business model and started from scratch, dramatically reducing the water they use by switching to a blend of cotton and a processed wood fiber. Some of the brand's most popular items had to go. They were too toxic. We had requests to bring that, that style back and it was a really easy no. For us, we kind of had a moment where it was like, are we going to continue doing what we're doing or are we going to make our brand a vehicle for change and for exposure onto this issue? That commitment has just earned Triarchy a Fashion Impact Award for being socially conscious. I'm in love with North American fiber. Ontario designer Peggy Sue Devon Smiltniks is also an eco trendsetter with her collection full of woven natural fibers drawn straight from the local farm. I've made large mass market lines for very big collections and companies. It wasn't until my friends became farmers and I went up and volunteered on their farms that I realized, ah, oh, look at these natural materials. A far cry from the fast fashion giants dominating the landscape, but even some of them are cashing in on the trend. H&M has a conscious collection made with sustainable fabrics. It's legit, not greenwashing, says this expert. And the company is tackling the dismal statistic that only 1% of clothes is fully recycled. It's brands like H&M that are actually investing thousands or millions sorry, of euros uh, into this technology so that it actually can scale. That's big picture, but what can average shoppers do to help? Things like washing in cold water, doing full loads of laundry, uh, using an eco-friendly laundry detergent, and hanging to dry. You know, those are some really easy things that we can be doing on a daily basis that will actually collectively have a massive impact. She says there's been a real shift, 
and the movement to make fashion more green is gaining momentum. And everyone has to remember, it's about progress over perfection. We should all just support each other in our baby steps and not be like, you have to do it this certain way and be so enclosed in this one box of checking all these things off in order to be sustainable. It kind of negates baby steps sort of count too. Salima Shivji, CBC like News, that. Toronto. Coming up on The National, ever wonder where the phrase 420 comes from? Well, you'll find out in our moment of the day. But first, tomorrow marks two years since Prince died of a fentanyl overdose. Since then, his musical renown has only grown. But tonight, we're getting a glimpse into other facets of his life. It's been seven hours and 13 days. It has been 34 years since Prince wrote Nothing Compares to You, 28 years since Sinead O'Connor made it a global hit. And now we're hearing his demo version for the very first time on a week that's bringing new insight into the life and death of this influential artist. Since you took your love away. As we told you last night, the investigation into Prince's death from an overdose two years ago has closed with no criminal charges. And now authorities are making public their files, including photos of the artist's Minnesota compound, Paisley Park. Rare images of a sanctuary that the famously private prince kept from public view. They give you a sense of his audacious style and a casual approach to daily life, as well as some images that you might not expect. There are drugs for pain and drugs to treat opiate withdrawal. This newly released video shows him visiting a doctor the day before he died. Weeks before that, a doctor's note of concern to Prince's longtime friend. He just doesn't look very well. We're also learning more about the emergency landing that the star's plane made in Illinois a week before his death. Prince had overdosed. He was unresponsive. One shot of an opioid antidote failed to revive him, but it was a second shot that jolted him into consciousness. Documents show close friends were deeply concerned about his drug use and were trying to help him get better. Nothing can stop these lonely tears from falling. Tell me, baby, where, where did I go wrong? The Jets with a dominating performance. And with that, the Winnipeg Jets are on to the second round of the Stanley Cup playoffs. They beat the Minnesota Wild 5-0 in tonight's Game 5. A cause for celebration inside and outside Bell MTS Place. Whiteout conditions in full effect with thousands of Jets fans dressed to support the team. Well, the threat of a strike by Canadian Pacific Rail workers is off for now. The two unions threatening to walk off the job over contract issues say they've postponed their strike. They had set a deadline of midnight tonight, but now say a contract offer from CP will go to a vote. No word yet on when that will take place. Today we have agreed that the next head of the Commonwealth shall be His Royal Highness Prince Charles, the Prince of Wales. And bowing to the Queen's wishes, today leaders of the Commonwealth agreed that Prince Charles should be the next head of the organization. The Queen told the group in a speech yesterday that she hoped her son would one day take her place, even though the role isn't technically hereditary, and it is up to the group to choose a successor. So we have talked a lot about 420 tonight. The abiding question is why this day became one of pot celebration and activism. For a long time, the truth was shrouded in a bit of urban legend. 420 was said to be a police code for a marijuana violation in California or to refer to the number of chemical components in the plant. In fact, it could be traced back to the early 1970s and five guys known as the Waldos. They went to high school together, they got high together, and as stoners, adventurers, and pranksters, they made an indelible mark on the world. So we managed to get in touch with two, Steve Capper, Dave Reddix. Tonight's moment is the true story of 420. We used to hang out at a, a wall on the campus of San Rafael High School in San Rafael, California. And we'd sit up there between classes and make fun of people walking by. So one day we're sitting on our wall where we'd hang out. Buddy came up to me and he goes, hey, my, my brother's in the Coast Guard. And a bunch of guys in the Coast Guard, U.S. Coast Guard, are growing marijuana. And this is 1971. 
that's plausible. <laughs> and uh, so they go, they're growing marijuana. And for some reason, they think that their commanding office is going to bust them and they don't want to be busted. So they de decided to relinquish their growing patch and they made a map and gave us, said we could, we could pick it. So we decided, uh, we got out of school around 3, 3.15. It was like a, a flexible schedule. A couple of the guys had sports practice, football, and just enough time. That was approximately an hour. So we decided to meet. There's a statue on our campus of the chemist Louis Pasteur. We decided to meet at Louis, Louis Pasteur at 420. And there's so many people out there claiming they started this uh, with things like, oh, we met at a pizza parlor at, at 420, 420 and we sparked up. And then there's other people that are out there putting, uh, taking old photos and photoshopping 420 into them. It's hilarious. But the one thing they all have in common is they have zero proof, and we're the only ones in the world that have uh, documented proof to prove our story of the first usage in 1971. Multiple pieces of, of, of physical evidence proof. There's a 420 Fest in Atlanta, and you have these big corporate sponsors like Home Depot. And, and I, I even saw another one. It's Bed, Bath, and Bong. <laughs> People will always, I think, uh, uh, there'll always be commemoration, I guess, of all the decades it took to get to where we are. And I think 420 is like, it's a spirit thing that, you know, everybody can get together and have some fun. Be, with, be friendly. Be Greek. friendly, be kind to people. And it's it's become a thing, like it's an evergreen story, excuse the pun, but uh, every year it's kind of like Christmas for weed. <laughs> Christmas for weed. So that's, those are two of the five Waldos and you heard that story about them hanging out on a wall, that's why they called themselves Waldos. And apparently they just kept up this code because one of their dads was a narc, you know, so they, they had to keep it quiet. <laughs> and, and, and because this story is, is just so crazy, when, when the Oxford English Dictionary decided, hey, we're gonna add 420 to the lexicon, uh, apparently, well, of course, I suppose they had to do their homework, they, they looked at the records, they reviewed them and came to the conclusion that, hey, the story checks out, so they're credited as the creators. They don't get a penny, though, from all the other <laughs> usage. They seem pretty chill about it, not too surprising, especially on this day. Um, there is, a, our producer was telling us, a beer that's been created by a craft brewery, and they have a lifetime pass to that, but I don't think they're beer guys. <laughs> no. Anyway, that is The Never National know. for Friday, 420. Good night. <laughs> Good night. Good night.